okay. I broke my foot a couple days ago, and I think I'm actually okay, but I'm going to leave this here just in case, because sometimes it goes to sleep. Um, so, uh, thank you. I know I'm the last thing between you and lunch, so I'm um, going to give a talk, try to do a rapid-fire kind of um, summary of what's happened over the last couple of years. I've been a disinformation, now it's called disinformation research. It didn't have a name a couple of years ago, and we'll actually kind of go into why that was a bit of a problem. So I'm going to start by saying something glaringly obvious. Something is wrong on the internet. Um, and it's actually, so much is wrong on the internet that now it has its entire lexicon, right? So we have misinformation, disinformation, propaganda, fake news, filter bubbles. And rather than giving a list of definitions, some of you probably understand a little bit of the nuance in those terms, I actually want to walk through a couple of examples. Uh, because I think that you'll, re I think that uh, the kind of showing will um, help you see what you might be seeing as well. So during the evaluation of what Russia was doing, I was one of the researchers looking for the content from platform to platform. Uh, looking at the, the kind of spread of the content, where it appeared, when it appeared. This was, of course, prior to uh, the platforms, the tech platforms acknowledging that this was a problem. So this was all work that we were doing uh, in 2017. So one of the things I did one night was um, we had this, um, you know, information was trickling out in dribs and drabs. There were a bunch of independent researchers who were sharing information in Slack channels and Twitter groups. Uh, this, the fact that a page called Muslim Voice had been one of the uh, internet research agency pages came out, and so I started looking for the content for Muslim Voice. So I found this cache of content on Pinterest one night, and I happened to be logged in in my real account. It really, just sort of like a random collection of clicking on things, I find myself uh, on this Pinterest uh, board. It is clearly a, it looks like a repository of this content. It's just entirely posts, memes uh, from the Instagram account Muslim Voice. So I say, oh, that's interesting. I click around a little bit more, discover that there's also content from the LGBT page. They had a number, you know, hundreds of different pages. One of them was a pro-LGBT page. So this one Pinterest account had Muslim voice, pro-LGBT, OK, likely a Russian account. Log it, archive it, send it to the New York Times. Um, so I get a call from the reporter the next day saying, hey, we want to talk a little bit more uh, about some of, the, some of the stuff that you found. OK, fine. So I. I was, <laughs> I was on vacation with my kids. I was at Disneyland, which is why there's a switch from web to mobile here. Um, and I pull up Pinterest, and I'm like going back to find the stuff that I was looking at the other night. And I realize my entire feed has transformed. Literally two hours, this is what I start to see. So I've got Russian language craft projects over there. And over here, I've got Dinesh D'Souza videos. Now, I'd been on Pinterest for about six years. I planned my wedding on Pinterest. I planned my kid's first birthday on Pinterest. I have an instant pot. I have so many recipes on Pinterest. But that does not, uh, pumpkins, it was around Halloween time, I guess. Um, <laughs> but that doesn't matter because one hour of looking at the content and all of a sudden, um, collaborative filtering kicks in, right? Collaborative filtering is the uh, recommendation engine algorithm by which the platform decides that you're not going to see just the content you looked at, the type of content you looked at. You're going to see things that people who also looked at that content looked at. So not, I looked at uh, these Islamic memes, ergo I'm going to get more Islamic memes. No, it's I looked at these Islamic memes, ergo I'm going to get the content that the other people who looked at these memes also looked at, which is where we get the Russian trolls who likely put it up, and then the extremists uh, on the right wing that it was targeted at. Case study number one. Number two, I did a lot of the work on the ISIS stuff uh, for State Department through US Digital Service. Um, we were looking at how to counter-propagandize, um, how to think about counter-messaging, how to think about the fact that uh, ISIS was building up a virtual caliphate, and the tech companies were remarkably unconcerned about this whole thing for several years. Again, the same kind of thing. You would watch one YouTube video. You would be taken down this path. I think Zainab Tufekci called it the radicalization engine. That's how we came to think of it a couple years prior. So again, um, the type of content that we see, this has grave consequences, not just for individuals, uh, but for society as well. So let's walk through how this came to be, and let's start back in Web 1.0, uh, where we all had our GeoCities pages or our blogger accounts. We could all write whatever we wanted. Zero-cost publishing, the idea that we're democratizing ideas and we're giving people the power to say whatever they want. This, is, you know, this was kind of one of the great promises of the internet, that it was no longer just these kind of storied institutions that had access to, uh, to speech and to, um, to um, getting a message out, but that anyone could do it. So, of course, if anyone can publish anything, then surely misinformation has existed forever. And that's, of course, true. And it existed you know, on my GeoCities page likely as well, right? But then we get to, uh, then we get to Web 2.0, where we have the rise of social. So this is the early aughts. And so we have one after another. We have these tech platforms that begin to emerge. And what we start to see happen there is the 
experience is better when they amass large audiences. And so it almost kind of self-selects, where these gigantic standing audiences are in one place. So we no longer have this decentralized sporadic content. Instead, we have people largely kind of communicating both with the people that they know in real life on Facebook and then getting yelled at by complete strangers on Twitter. But you have the situation where there are these uh, amassed standing audiences. So the network effects uh, create this entrenchment of power in a new information ecosystem. What happens next? All of a sudden, all of these people are on all of these platforms, which means that timeline-based feed no longer works. So reverse chronological order is deprecated, and instead we get algorithmic amplification, where the types of recommendation engines that I was showing you, the content-based filtering, the collaborative filtering, all of the um, tools for presenting information to people uh, in a way to keep them engaged, to keep them on the platform, this is where we get algorithmic amplification, and we start to see the emergence of trending. Uh, stories that, you know, you obviously you want to see what's trending, you want to see what your friends are talking about. We see search, right? SEO gamification becomes a huge business for a while until Google kind of gets its hands around that. And then we see the recommendation systems. So the kind of three curatorial functions, search, trending, recommendation, um, they appear kind of across the web nearly simultaneously. What happens? Well, at this point, we see popularity begin to outrank truth. And that's because since these are engagement-driven algorithms, what they're looking for is what do people engage with? Well, people engage with things that they like, or they engage with things that are sensational, or they engage with things that make them feel a certain way. So you look at this, you know, I did some work on uh, the anti-vaccine movement over years, and you look at what the CDC puts out, which is this very staid, like, it's unclear to us the extent to which XYZ has happened, versus the um, kind of extremist rhetoric that you see on the other side, which is much more um, emotionally resonant content. And so you begin to see this interesting situation where the things that are popular uh, really begin to, uh, they hit all of the notes necessary to trigger the virality engines that keep this content proliferating. So of course, uh, who realizes this really early? <laughs> Conspiratorial communities and people who traditionally didn't really have access to mainstream um, ways to spread this kind of candidly nonsense. Uh, and so we begin to see this rise. And yes, everybody's democratized, everybody has a voice, but there's this asymmetry of passion where nobody in this room gets up and tweets about how the earth is round and vaccines don't cause autism and Pizzagate really was never a thing. So this creates this interesting situation where a lot of the content that's created is created by conspiratorial communities, which means that when you search for key terms, we have this interesting phenomenon of what we call news voids or keyword voids, where you're much more likely to see the content created by the group for the message, even if the message is extreme or conspiratorial, uh, because the regular kind of mainstream news sources don't catch up. Incels is probably the most recent example of this. What happens next? Well, at the same time, we have the uh, ads interface that we were just hearing about. So we have this remarkable ability to target. So now you not only have the everybody in one place, everybody saying what they want, uh, algorithms amplifying the most popular or sensational messages, but we can also make sure that we can target people. So if we do want to grow more niche audiences, um, we can reach out and we can target them with ads. And they're all, again, on the platforms. <laughs> So I've been saying this, I think I've had this slide since 2013. <laughs> the power to influence opinions increasingly lies with those who can most widely and effectively disseminate a message. Um, that's because everything is a marketing campaign now. And so uh, here's the slide that everyone was like, I can't believe you're putting this up at PDF, but who realizes this really, really early on? DARPA does in 2012. So this is the thing that is almost never talked about, which is actually whenever you hear the government was not on this, no, no, that's not true. The government was on it back in 2012. And so DARPA had this program called Social Media and Strategic Communication, SMISC. It's all open source. The archives are out there. You can go read it. Um, this was things like the Twitter bot detection challenge. Imagine that, a bot detection challenge being run on Twitter in 2013, 2014. Um, so these are the kinds of things, the program description, uh, through the program, DARPA seeks, seeks to develop tools to help identify misinformation or deception campaigns to counter them with truthful information, reducing adversaries' abilities to manipulate events. So what was the popular reception to SMISC? Well, everybody hated it. Uh, the government was interfering in the free and open web, and how could we possibly want Uncle Sam monitoring social network communications? Because as we've heard, there are you know, some terrible things that can come out of that. But then on the flip side, this is the kind of program that was prescient and that understood what was happening in the information warfare space long before, literally years before, we could impress upon the platforms the need to do something about it. 
So now we hit the present day where we have this system that's evolved over the last 10 years to facilitate democratized propaganda and that uh, military and defense did realize was being used to facilitate weaponized narratives. So that's where we are today. We have misinformation and broken recommendation systems that aren't just ubiquitous, they're actually commodified. So because why did it take so long to get us to the point where we have the tech platforms as willing partners and trying to find a solution? Well, that's because, again, likes, clicks, engagement, all of this drives ads. And when you have that social network ecosystem where all of the people are, they're all attention brokers, which means they all compete with each other. So there is deep incentive um, for, let's talk about Twitter. Let's use Twitter as an example here. Uh, when 9 to 15% of the users on Twitter are bots, but Twitter's stock price is dependent on its... Uh, on its monthly average user numbers, does Twitter go in and aggressively take out the bots? Well, for a long time, the answer was no. So, there we go. So again, we had um, the rise of conspiratorial communities. We saw this stuff happening early and often with them. Then we had ISIS, which literally built a virtual caliphate across the social media ecosystem, and we did nothing. And we did nothing for years. The EFF wrote helpful talks about how one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. And if we took down ISIS content, what on earth would that mean for free speech on the internet? So this is where we see that absolutism really kind of coming back to bite us in the ass. Then we look at Russia, which did the exact same playbook that the, conspir the conspiracists and then ISIS did, but they did it covertly. And so instead of being brazen and building a brand as ISIS did, they just ran the same playbook, but they did it covertly. And so we've begun to see some of this trickling out. More and more is going to continue to come out. These were pages that had hundreds of thousands of followers. This is not small. And we keep hearing about ads, ads, ads. Ads is one vehicle to amass a large audience. The thing that we are not talking about is groups. If you want to go and you want to reach a standing audience, why on earth would you pay for it when you can just go and co-opt an existing community? And this is where we start to get at the idea that it's not as easy as keyword detection. It's really much more of an information security problem that requires more of a cybersecurity type solution with things like red teaming and pen testing and thinking more in the way that, that DARPA and other information security agencies do where they realize that a full understanding of what's going on in these communities is absolutely critical to understanding how this is going to continue to evolve. Because dealing with ads is fighting the last war. And we have elections coming up, and candidly, we don't really seem to be in much, you know, much further along than we were a couple years ago. So um, no one is coming. It is up to us. That's because really still nobody is in charge, because we have the regulators that don't fully understand what they're regulating. We have a couple of different um, avenues for regulation that I think we're going to talk about in my afternoon session. We have the platforms that, to their credit, are beginning to, to take this much more seriously than they had in the past, um, but it's not quite there yet. We have civil society. We had um, April Glazier is going to be in, in my session also, and she had a great quote uh, with regard to civil society. So organizations like Cato, the ACLU, and the EFF, who were really vehemently against some of the DARPA programs, actually, um, saying the people most equipped to propose a way to regulate large internet platforms and then fight for it have been jarringly quiet. And that's because we actually aren't seeing that same kind of level of civic pressure. We, we do see it kind of targeted at government and government overreach. We don't really see it um, coming out as much, recognizing the kind of shades of gray or the areas where uh, private businesses need to be dealt with in a little bit more aggressively, maybe. Um, so, you know, it's not all doom and gloom. <laughs> Um, you know, on the government front, Mr. Zuckerberg did just show up uh, to, in front of Congress and in front of the EU. Um, inside the tech companies, you know, we do have interesting projects. Google's Project Redirect is one that I really like a lot where they are looking at how can we take that recommendation engine and begin to recognize signatures of radicalization and maybe send people in a different direction. Um, let's see, there's, uh, we're starting to see whistleblowers coming out. The Center for Humane Tech uh, is really kind of attracting the attention of a lot of ex-tech people who want to talk about solutions. Um, including most notably some like uh, Guillaume Cheslo, who wrote some great pieces recently about um, the YouTube recommendation engine in particular and how to think about radicalization on the platform where most of our kids and teenagers are spending their time. So we have to be talking about how we translate our values uh, into industry norms. Um, these attacks have a profound impact on democracy, which is dependent on an informed electorate 
and allowing for mass manipulation operations and the unchecked rise of conspiracy theorists, which to the point made earlier, it's not just bots. It, that really is very, very true. It's not just bots at all. And that's where we get at the really hard questions, which is how do we think about things like do not recommend? What do we allow to stay on the platform and be discoverable perhaps through search, but the platforms don't proactively suggest it? How do we think about radicalization via recommendation engines? How do we answer these questions when the only people who really understand what's going on in terms of those radicalization mechanisms are the platforms because only they have the data about when someone watches this video, what do they go do next? So these are the kinds of things um, that we're going to be talking about uh, in my session. And I'm uh, happy to turn it over to questions now. We'll take a few questions. Yeah. Thank you. Here. Can, can you sit or, I think or so. lean? <laughs> I'll lean. Here, we can lean. We can lean. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so questions. Uh, the first one that's right there. Can you talk a bit more about big tech, how, how big tech has created more mistrust of the government control of the internet? You know, I think you alluded to that a little bit, the, the sort of, uh, you know, pushing back on government trying to take more of a proactive approach to these problems. You know, it's interesting because we're at the, um, we're at the five year mark, I think, in the Snowden revelations. And I would bet, um, yeah, five I would, my years. opinion of that is different mm -hmm. than a lot of people's. <laughs> mm -hmm. But, um, I think that I think we haven't ever really recovered from that, right? We we don't have tech working particularly well with the government, uh, partially because of the stuff that went on there, partially because tech doesn't want to be seen as a pawn of the U.S. government. These are multinational companies, and so of course they don't want to be seen as uh, doing the you know doing the bidding of USG. Um, you know, I was in the room during some of the conversations where we were trying to deal with the ISIS thing, and. They had air cover from civil society, so there was not very much pressure to inspire anyone to take action back in 2014 and uh, early 2015 when we started to see these things happen. Uh, because there really was a sense that government shouldn't be telling the platforms how to police speech or how to police content. Uh, that they, they, you know, they had their own kind of First Amendment right to decide how to moderate accordingly. But simultaneously, they were being told that moderation was censorship. And so until we get away from the idea that moderation is censorship, I think it's a really difficult Mm. Um, difficult to, to see a path forward there. Right. What about uh, the role of uh, elected officials here? I mean, do you, you know, <laughs> um, watching those hearings uh, recently, you know, uh, apart from the tech executives trying to avoid or, you know, giving answers that were incomplete answers, you saw a lot of politicians who clearly didn't have their heads around this either. I mean, is there anybody or any way uh, that we can get some of the, the, the people who, in theory, have oversight power? Yeah, so I did a lot of those briefings. Um, so uh, you can see that it's kind of varying degrees of sophistication. Um, I can talk a little bit about that, I think. So back in September, uh, myself, Tristan Harris, and Roger McNamee went down to DC and said, like, it'd be really great to convene hearings because the, the Russia thing was kind of an ongoing battle. You know, this was at the time before. Um, we were still hearing things from Facebook like it was only $100,000 worth of ads. That really riled up a lot of independent researchers who were like, no, no, we're tracking this all over the internet. This is millions and millions of engagements. Um, and so we went down to DC and, and said, like, wouldn't it be great to have hearings so that also we felt that it was really becoming politicized. Russia was becoming this like, um, this politically divisive issue. And we were saying, you know, people need to understand what happened and a bipartisan hearing would be a great way to get past that. We wrote up, I wrote personally 55 pages worth of briefing docs on like literally internet 101. It was like, this is an ad roll. This is how YouTube monetizes. This is a click. Um, this, is, <laughs> this is a click through rate. This is, you know, this is engagement. This is likes. This is organic content. This is virality. Um, made a ton of these briefing docs. And for the first hearing, I got to say, there were some staffers who were incredible. So the SS, the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence in particular, um, just truly remarkable in their sophistication around the issue and their ability to educate their other colleagues. That's not true throughout Congress. Um, that, as I learned later, that was not the norm. That was that was the exception. Um, so I think, as far as like how to solve it, get you know, there's groups of us who are kind of um, researchers and in places like Data for Democracy, where we have just people contributing in a Slack channel just drop in, drop out, talking about things that they're seeing that, that merit further attention. Um, we have people who write op-eds. We have people who go to DC and brief. You know, it came up earlier, I, and I feel like also, maybe I heard you on a podcast with Mike Masnick talking about this, that most of the actual watchdogging work 
that's being done is being done by volunteers. And that's very true, yeah. And journalists, to some degree journalists as well, right? Who yes. get paid a, a little more than volunteers. Um, <laughs> but that, that the infrastructure, the civic infrastructure uh, to form some pressure, it's not coming from the advocacy organizations no, to it's date. Not. It's not, so a lot of the complaints that we hear from congressional staffers actually are the only people who come to brief them are big tech, which has the lobbyists, the telecoms, which of course are you know, kind of an adversarial relationship with big tech. And then they periodically get things from civil society, but oftentimes they feel that that's just kind of like anti-tech. So they're not hearing, uh, one, one of the reasons that Center for Humane Tech, that Tristan started that, or that we started uh, Data for Democracy, was the idea that there was an opportunity to create nonpartisan or bipartisan um, recommendations and to, you know, I sat down with Senator Graham's team and others, um, you know, we do go and meet with Republicans regularly actually to try to make sure that uh, the realization is that this is not a partisan issue and that it does need bipartisan consensus and uh, we need to come to a shared solution about what the internet hmm. uh, is going to look like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, a lot more to talk about.